The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Welcome to Gen XYZ where we have committed ourselves to discussing the topics of the youth that are contemporary to the youth and to find solutions therein within a discussion platform. And uh, we have with us a topic, a topic that has been within the public forum for quite some time and that is education and the disparities that have led within this time period. What exactly are these barriers? What exactly are these issues? We have someone to break those down for us and to move into a more conclusive and a more objective solution sort of oriented discussion. And that man is Ishan Bandar, the Registrar of Navalaka College of Higher Studies. He's also a coach and an academic counsellor. Thank you so much sir, for joining us today. Um, Let's just directly get into the topic and you know break it down because it's a vast topic as we discussed uh, prior to this uh, uh, discussion as well. My first question is um, if we structure this discussion this, this way I think it will help our viewers as well on uh, firstly about the key barriers. Now teachers are witnessing separate barriers, children are witnessing another set of barriers, all the stakeholders either parents or the middlemen and women that are involved are witnessing separate areas of black barriers. How have you seen this? Maybe just talking about teachers and children, what are the key barriers as of now because they have been given this new thing called online education and we are trying to work around it, both secondary and higher education equally facing different kinds of issues. How have you read this entire situation? Uh, thanks, Danidu, for uh, having me on the show today. And uh, you're absolutely spot on. Mm -hmm. And because this pandemic has uh, hit uh, almost all the aspects, all the economic aspects in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, for last one and a half years, uh, as the higher education providers, as well as the hi high school segment, uh, the teachers, the academic staff, teachers, and students struggling a lot okay and but uh, uh, as of now a lot of uh, institutions a lot of universities institutions and schools have come up with so much so many strategies and so many methodologies to overcome this issue mm -hmm. okay so before i come back to your uh, question uh, danido so uh, when we talk about the uh, talk about the education mismatch mm -hmm. Uh, especially, uh, uh, first we have to talk about what's education. Exactly. So, uh, the, the reasons for having the education, I think uh, mainly it makes a complete person. And it develops the analytical skills, problem solving skills, and moreover, it gives you a perspective to look at yourself. Okay? And it uh, takes you to uh, the next generation and I think uh, more vividly and more importantly we have to uh, it builds and it helps you to build your career so that's very important and uh, coming back to your questions in uh, education mismatch and the barriers the current generation with this, this pandemic situation that students are facing mm -hmm. is uh, you know there is a very uh, you know as diverse, as you, right. Very diverse, and right now uh, there are so many, uh, uh, you know, things discussing in the uh, public and uh, private right. media at the moment, and uh, especially uh, uh, the protests that we are experiencing right now with the teachers. Exactly. So that's the pressure coming from the school. Uh, teachers and uh, maybe from different segments in the from the pa parents side and uh, uh, so Something, I, since you touched on the protest issue now uh, clearly it has taken a very political uh, standpoint and let's like keep all of that aside something uh, like I want to touch on us now we see the teachers being a very unique 
important stakeholder within all of this, in higher education, the secondary education. So they are literally the people that are teaching the next generation. Of course. And uh, I think you touched on it very well. These protests, or without touching their political lines or any of that, uh, is there some form of built-in because of the issues that they have to face on a daily basis? Is there a frustration among teachers? Are there issues that we have to like maybe have like we have to identify immediately? Of course, I think it's more about frustration because, as you know, uh, uh, we started this lockdown uh, with this uh, COVID-19 pa pandemic in March, mid of March last year. From there, now it's almost one and a half years. And, uh, you know, they work, these teachers in school segment, they work with a lot of difficulties, okay? Sometimes they, they didn't have a single computer at home, they might have their own kids to expose to this online teaching. Okay, you believe me or not? How many tuition masters lost their jobs exactly. in in regional uh, areas because those who have really uh, built strategies and uh, come up with the technology, who was tech savvy people, who has really. Uh, uh, brought that up to the level where uh, students can really absorb the uh, learning and the education which they require. So I think in the regional segment, even in Colombo, school teachers still struggling. For example, recently I had a visit to Candy and we conducted an uh, online teaching training program and we found out a lot of teachers find some online platforms are not familiar to them okay and some of the uh, tools that they are, they have been asked to use is not that user friendly, that, that user -friendly. so teachers themselves come on, coming up with a lot of solutions and even i have exports one of the teacher has built a tool which covers uh, 360 de degrees uh, in most of the functions in school teaching mm -hmm. and with Ministry of Education they are coming up with a lot of options and I think uh, the future is not that bad we feel okay because there are so much of potential out there so I'm not I don't say that I'm against the protest or I'm supporting this protest yeah. okay but but we really have to see Within the, cla the, the classroom, during one, one and a half years period, okay, we have around 30 to 35 students studying in a classroom. One student, or maybe a couple of students might struggle in communication. But this online learning enable these students who are not spoken and those who are not interacting with the teachers to go out a breakout room online, talk to them separately, mm. okay? open yeah. to the teacher okay a yeah. lot of opportunities are available okay a lot of avenues have created with these online platforms okay. it's just a matter of we bringing this culture this online learning and post pandemic situation it's the blended learning we are talking about a combination combination of online and uh, the uh, teaching in person so i think we are heading towards that yes as you said there is a problem at the moment but we have to uh, we have solutions in our hands and it might definitely help us create a bright future for high school especially primary and high school kids mm -hmm. because university students anyway they are exposed to this online teaching mechanisms so yeah, yeah. Uh, something I want to really touch on now we have to go for a break uh, eventually also uh, before we go in for the break, uh, you, know, you work in counselling for education as well. You work to counsel people with pertaining to their careers and all of that. You now that dynamic also changed pertaining to the advice you have to give and the approach that you have to take for either parents or children. How has that been? How has that been? Ch that change been to you personally, person who's involved in education and higher education primarily. How did what? What are the questions that you are facing as of now? Uh, right now, uh, uh, Danidu, when 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 we we were in a lockdown situation this online teaching the parents are very vigilant and students are stuck at home and they had no option other than for gaming or other than watching TV or maybe playing with their laptops now 
once this you know restrictions travel restri restrictions are removed and they have options of going to their friends places and they are missing a lot of classes they are missing a lot of live streaming classes they tend to see the recordings mm -hmm. but they don't have that interaction as as they want okay they 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 have a lot of clarifications to make so after after we um, lift the travel restrictions we have so many other barriers coming up and a lot of counseling is needed because students are having a lot of depression exactly. being at home and so many other family issues coming up okay and i think uh, more than the, uh, uh, more than uh, the past era now with the new uh, generation and with the new uh, after post pandemic situation we will come across lot of uh, issues and uh, the academics and maybe the counseling staff career coaches has to involved in lot of these things mm -hmm. to help these kids mm -hmm. and shaping up their future okay. there's a lot of modifications that are required in facing these new issues now uh, a lot of things that i want to discuss with you that stem out of the issues that we just discussed we'll take a very short break your vision xyz stay with us to gen xyz we are in conversation with ishan bandar the registrar of nawlog college of higher studies he's also a coach and um does academic counseling um a wide array and a pretty difficult uh, subject that um, i should say because everyone found this as a new experience when it came to the pandemic no one knew what to do no one really knew how to at least be flexible in that scenario so i think you all are doing a huge service as of now um of in in breaking down these you know elements in these issues that you all faced one thing that you also mentioned to us outside as well is the requirement and you mentioned this within our first segment is the requirement to match the child that comes out of high education or even secondary education to the skill sets that are required by the industry and that mismatch is available now added to that mismatch there is a pandemic also so multiple issues that are coming up how do you address this long term short term what are the primary goals that you have established in your mind how maybe maybe let's not talk about how we can address it but currently because if we can talk about that in the last segment but currently how do you exactly witness that blending blended learning model working yes danidu uh, before i come to your question danidu if we really talk about the education mismatch uh, in general terms uh, uh, the skills available in the labor market do not match with the demand in the labor market so there is a gap between the demand and the supply in the labor market so in sri lankan context we we can see a horizontal educational mismatch where whatever uh, the the academics or maybe the producing from the academic programs will not the skills will not match with the required skills uh, need by the industry required by the industry so that's where we really having this problem so with this blended learning so this is an fabulous and golden opportunity in front of us uh, danidu because uh, what i see with this uh, online learning lot of platforms are available lot of free courses are av available and lot of avenues are available lot of virtual incubators are coming up from different industries mm -hmm. for example if i take one example uh, from google from to microsoft mm -hmm. from to you know even the local uh, software companies they have virtually open uh, the, the organization small clusters to work the undergraduate along alongside alongside the alongside with the, their studies so uh, not only the vocational education segment even with the undergraduate lot of international universities lot of local entities trying to now trying to embed some industry components in the first and second year of their study especially when it comes to the 
undergraduate uh, education. But this is not limited to the undergraduate or maybe the academic programs. I think we have to really think about the high school segment as well from grade 6 to grade 11, grade 12. So that's very important uh, aspect that we have to look into and uh, I think uh, the His Excellency the President uh, has announced and declared the next 10 years as the skill uh, development uh, uh, decade. So I think we, when we talk about that direction, we have the goal. Mm -hmm. They have long-term goal to achieve maybe by 2029, 20, 2030. But how we how we mitigate the skill gap? That's short term, short -term. Yeah. and that's that's with this blended learning and industriousness and how we communicate with the industry. Not only university segment in first and second year, we have to address this with the school segment as well. Okay. So then we will not have problem of getting required uh, labor mm -hmm. for entry level jobs. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of gap in the entry level jobs as well. So I think uh, yeah, that's that, open. That, that adequately answers so because that mismatch is the issue that we have like sort of identified. Now uh, you all are in administrative positions, in management positions and we all would have witnessed you know, this industry, this blended behavior is very important when even you hire someone and that is where, where all of this comes from. If we move to that portion of things now, as an administrator, what are the key issues that you witness? Because the next segment I really want to talk a bit about examinations and evaluations and things like that. As an administrator, looking at universities, looking at universities not taking in students, looking at universities that are now objectively pursuing online learning only. What do you think the future there is? Like where do where should students be targeting as of now? Should they just be working with what they have? Or should they look at other avenues as of now? No, as of now, as, as you know, a lot of students are waiting to, you know, pursue their higher studies in overseas universities exactly. and even in locally. And with this pandemic situation, we, we never know how, how long it will take for them to physically transfer to these particular universities. Okay? Okay. They are currently uh, you know, in touch with their professors, in touch with their uh, you know, tutors in these particular universities, but for a period of more than one and a half years. And now they have left with some of very technical subjects. But these overseas universities are coming up with a lot of in-tech tools, education technology tools, mm -hmm. to have a virtual laboratory facilities mm -hmm. and c certain other virtual uh, 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 computer facilities and so many other platforms coming up to facilitate this. But I think the youth should not wait till the borders are open they have so many other courses they that they can, yeah, they, that they can pursue. For example, if I take one example, if somebody wants to do uh, a bachelor in marketing, mm -hmm. okay, bachelor of business specialized in marketing, then why don't he take a short course in online short course in digital marketing at the moment? So a lot of courses free of charge available at the moment who can, you know, they, they don't have to spend too much money, too much money on this. Yeah. So, uh, uh, interesting sort of uh, subject line there. Now, uh, since I, 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 we wanted, because we have given a lot of priority to talking about the digital divide and technology not reaching rural communities is a huge issue. But since we have given it a lot of prominence, I didn't want to talk about it, but I have to touch on that subject with you as well. If you could, in, in brief, before we go into our next uh, break, address how exactly this digital divide can be can we address it as of now or should we immediately move back to classroom based that normal system of communication either for higher or secondary education or is this something we can actually implement because within our, my last segment we wanted to really talk about the lessons we have learned from online education so in ha having that in your mind how can should like is this a sustainable solution that's my question is this online education system? online education I, I think um, if I approach your question uh, in, in, in a very simple manner, uh, uh, Danidu, I think online education would be the future. Mm -hmm. 
okay online education would be the future but not that alone okay the, the virtual learning and the blended learning hybrid would be the future of the the high high school as well as high. the tertiary education okay secondary and tertiary yes. education both okay the, for for example the most more theoretical subjects more theory oriented subjects could be delivered online right. more practical uh, oriented subjects could be taught face to face face to face and and again as a, as you know we have a lot of vocational colleges available, a lot of technical colleges available, a lot of practical, uh, you know, government has, you know, uh, Invest fund, invested and funded a lot of money in building these resources. So, but we don't have adequate students studying in these places. So we can utilize these facilities to come up with this blended learning mechanism. And, and students can, you know, the advanced level students, even the students from grade 9 to grade 11, they can also participate, you know, certain activities with the industry. Exactly. So I think uh, the future not, f future would be the online and the blended learning mechanism. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, the government as well as the universities, private education se sector, we are working towards to achieve that goal even though we have certain barriers okay yeah. but if we think positive mm -hmm. okay and if we really see the, uh, the, the, the the outcome of it okay yeah. and if we approach if you really uh, approach to it with certain actions True. then definitely we can overcome this mm -hmm. within short period of time exactly um, some very important thoughts there now even when you were discussing outside you gave us some very interesting thoughts again about uh, examinations and evaluation criteria i really want to get into that we will do that within our third segment you're watching gen xyz stay with us Gen XYZ. We are in conversation with Isham Bandar, the registrar of now local college of higher, Educa of higher studies. Um, uh, Mr. Shah, I now let's just uh, move up the issue <laughs> list. I would say uh, to examinations now. Multiple issues. One examinations. The culture we were given is exam-oriented academic system. We have an exam at the end, which is completely evaluated by another individual uh, for secondary education primarily. Uh, third, tertiary education based on the universities, there's either assignment or module based. You know, there are bit different, different ways of uh, how a child is evaluated. My first question before we get into anything is the current evaluation, current assessment methods, what are they and are they successful? Tanidu, I think uh, as you know, uh, this current examination based system is challenged because of this pandemic situation. So the, the government sector, the public sector schools has to postpone their ordinary level examinations, grade 5 scholarships, advanced level examinations. Whereas a lot of international universities and, and those who really, uh, you know, uh, teaching in international curriculums okay sometimes this topic might not be that great who's thinking in you know in, in kind of a narrow scope mm -hmm. but if we think it broadly definitely the central exam base and uh, exam centric education would not be the future and it's challenged okay whatever the given circumstance universities and the colleges high school they are trying with a lot of tools like we call it as lockdown browser we call it as this and that they are trying to conduct these online exams <laughs> but the outcome is you know the is it not at the required level we can't see the quality and we can't see the genuineness of these exams and and the, the evaluation is not up to the mark as we expect so as you know the continuous assessment based learning and assessment would be really in the future because universities adapted this five years ago 
okay so you have just you know 30% or 40% component evaluating at the end of the semester even it might be based on a certain assessment criteria maybe a presentation maybe a some other you know report and the student is evaluated throughout this particular teaching period with different set of assessment with continuous assessments and similarly with blended learning it is very easy and even with online teaching continuous assessment is the way forward because after each session students have take home some assignments mm -hmm. okay yeah. so they, they they have the facilities in front of them they have the online materials and they will take take home certain assignments and there are a lot of ways and the technologies out there to check mm -hmm. whether the genuine with the the genuineness of the uh, person who took person who uh, take the exam yeah so that's the way forward i think so the the connection i want to make with you is now whether examinations the existence of examinations as you said of the assessment criteria has been questioned and put like put pressure on uh, like a lot of pressure has been put under it um my question is if we can change this evaluating criteria should we go there in the to the extent of having more practical evaluation of this if we do implement something like a blended model where going into the streets going into the industry this evaluation can take place there on a more practical level rather than the usual theoretical manner because a time based assessment would require someone to monitor what you or what he the student is doing is that sustainable my question is can we move forward with this or should we completely change the way we are evaluating students i don't see we have to completely change now in globally uh, than uh, than we have uh, two segments one is the vocational education vocational training and education segment and the traditional academic qualification offering by the universities mm -hmm. okay so if you let me give you an example with germany okay Germany has the uh, lowest unemployment rate than it do, okay, compared with all the other European countries, okay. So why is it the students' vocational education preference is more higher? It's more rewarding, mm -hmm. okay, and it's apprentice-based learning, and it's always having some kind of an industry relationship. Okay, they have some practical aspects. It's not that we have, you know, go and work with machineries. It's not that go with, you know, uh, work in a factory. It's not like that. But it's more, more about the, the engaged learning. Okay, so if the government, uh, the, the, if the government focus is to have the make the next 10 years as the uh, skill develop uh, give mo more prominence right. for the uh, skill development segment yes. definitely the assessment and examination uh, system definitely has to be changed otherwise we will not get the real preference from the students exactly. I, I think you understand what i'm trying yeah, to express yeah, yeah. because uh, students will not will will go behind the academic programs if we don't give more preference to the uh, vocational education so they have to uh, we have to very you know uh, keep them understand the you know the importance. unique importance and equality of each and every job exactly. to to sustain in this society True. okay so yes. that's i think uh, yeah. evaluation has to be changed otherwise the student direction because i'm i'm talking in uh, in my opinion as a uh, academic coach and career counselor so we sh we let students who come and talk to us and trying to explore the uh, opportunities that they have mm -hmm. if we really you know keep on c talking about the exam exam based uh, yeah. uh, evaluation method it's not going to work so then uh, see uh, the I think you touched on this, and I wanted to like uh, can let you continue there. This uh, they said school issue. Now, we, we, if I could give a little bit of a context to it, I think we discussed this outside as well. A big debate exists in society at school: the pro, the people that support it, and the people that are against it. People that say that that is what gives opportunity, a very valid sort of argument, and the people that say, okay, look, chance out certain amount of opportunities. It streamlines students; it doesn't. So, huge debate, huge uh, back and forth going there. 
Isetsuko is the system, but we have a system. <laughs> like we have identified this is the way we are going to uh, channel secondary education students to higher education. Other countries may have different systems. And then we have alternate pathways as well as in our local would have also identified. What are your thoughts on this Isetsuko system in this context? Now that disparity, now the system has been exposed. The disparities have been shown and we discussed that in the first segment as well. In all of this colossal, you know, number of issues, how, how, where does the ESET score, where, what's the position ESET score takes? Now, as you know now, we can't uh, change immediately the, the, the processes and the mechanisms that the government has implemented. Exactly. But, no, the, the problem what we see, the vacancies available in the state, the, the universities, the public universities and the private universities are limited. Even in the private universities are limited at the moment. Okay, that, So therefore I think uh, students might not choose the right program. They might go to the available program based on the Z score that they, they have obtained through advanced level. Students wanted to do, you know, completely different. I would say student wanted to do uh, LLB, mm -hmm. Bachelor of Laws, but he is ending up with doing Bachelor of Arts. Okay, student wanted to do medicine, but student is ending up with doing commerce, uh, commerce or biology or something like that. But at least because we should, Sri Lanka has a very diverse uh, the academic education program system. Okay, but end of the each degree program, they should be able to produce and st students should be able to acquire a certain skills which require to achieve their goal in their career. True. Okay, so throughout the three years or maybe throughout four years, they have to really uh, acquire some kind of a knowledge which they really. Uh, have a demand in the labor market okay so the traditional education uh, uh, the, uh, system we have to change a little bit for example we have to introduce certain minors certain electives which they wanted to you know do and complete based on their preference and and it might definitely added value for their CV mm -hmm. it will definitely add value for their personality. Because the specific skill they are good at is pretty much identified. Pretty much identified. Yeah. Okay. So that that's very important then. Uh, I, I just keeping you in the same subject, I want to take your understanding now since you work with multiple countries and multiple degree programs. How important is it that this decision is given mid degree now? You decide the minor and you maybe do an undergraduate course and you, and you go ahead now something that you know really I, I also held is when you mentioned to us there are students who have done two years here and now they have to go and complete their degree outside um, number of issues that they're facing so in the middle of this they have to make a decision about what their minor what their major is going to be how important is that how important is that decision for them how important is that exposure because decisions change as you as you were rightfully mentioned initial with the exposure they make that decision and that is why that should come here as well how how have you identified that? How have you seen the entire degree program function in those ways? No, in in, in in international universities, especially in I would say most of the developed countries, they are not making the decisions done in the in the uh, maybe not at the end of the first year, not at the sec, uh, end of the second year. They make the decisions then and there, sure. end of each semester before they enroll for the next semester. They can you know add or drop whatever the units that they need. Okay, say if they feel in this particular semester, if they feel I'm good, good in mathematics, so they can take another subject in mathematics in the second term. If they feel I'm good in, I would say, uh, marketing, he can take a, uh, another unit in marketing, international marketing in the second semester. Mm -hmm. So that's the education has been structured and their major will be determined at the end of the degree program. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they have been qualified and they'll be qualifying with whatever they desired and based on their, uh, you know, strengths specific and specific, specific subjects. Yeah, okay? I think a very important um, approach, very important suggestion that you have given there in order to, you know, really tactfully address this issue of bridging education and bridging industry requirements. Um, 
let's convert this into a more a solution oriented discussion with our last segment uh, you are watching jn xyz stay with us to Jen XYZ. We are in conversation with Ishan Bandar, the Registrar of Navaloka College of Higher Studies. Um, as we did discuss on previous segments as well, a tense situation for everyone, for all occupations, especially education. And uh, that really leads me to what I want to touch on within our last segment and really talk about what we can do. Now, there will be viewers who are at home who might be mid, who are undergraduates, who, who are just approaching their degree, who have finished and they're looking at a master's, maybe even a PhD. And there is a huge array of confusion about quality, about you know what I should be doing. And uh, something very important that you said was, look, whatever I said and done, quality is something that we have to maintain. So multiple standards to meet, multiple industry requirements to like, you know, cater to. In all of this, how do we start the decision making process? Like how, how do we approach all of that? Uh, Nanidu, I think, uh, uh, as you rightly said, we should not compromise on quality, okay? Because we have seen some of our Asian countries uh, for the, during the last 10, 20 years has led to that kind of a uh, problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, Sri Lanka is very, uh, you know, honored and our graduates have been uh, highly regarded in overseas countries especially in different industries for higher postgraduate studies those who have did those who have done well in uh, the undergraduates so we should not compromise on the quality but in this in the in the same line if you think in the same line uh, the the lot of academics the teaching staff has an ability you know uh, bring out new programs which will enable our students to be more skillful mm -hmm. okay? and job ready. Because, uh, uh, for example, let me, let me take a small example with your profession, Danindu. Mm -hmm. okay? And you are a prominent media personality. Mm -hmm. And a uh, lot of kids in schools, uh, they, they maybe after school, maybe during weekends, they come and join with different activities, different programs, and they present kids' news, yep. and, and they do some talent shows, and media institutions, they come and do workshops in school, both in private and uh, public sector, mm -hmm. okay? They have a very good, uh, nice, and very healthy relationship between t these two segments, the media institutions, as well as school. the school kids and the school segment. So I think we, we wanted to see that culture in the future. Yeah. It's not maybe in next 10 years time, immediately with this pandemic situation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very easy because company or industry doesn't really need to go to that particular place. So what was lacking, yeah. what, what was lacking sometimes Derena wanted to go to a rural place and they have to, I mean, a lot of cost involved. Yeah fuel for the resources and all the other facilities has to be provided. Now, all these industries, all these enterprises can really present virtually right. in the high school. Mm -hmm. Okay, This infrastructure, they are in the schools and even in front of the laptop. True. Okay? So, so it's not necessary for you to spend a hell of a lot of money and they can reduce the, uh, the expenses in training and development. Exactly. So they have a the, the lot of organizations, especially into different segments, I would say the IT industry, banks and service industry, some organization, even in manufacturing, they have spent uh, millions and millions on training and development. Mm -hmm. If we really bridge the school, uh, you know, uh, the skill set and the industry, definitely it will help 
to build the career so that's something that i w really wanted to touch very very important uh, line of thought i think you derana has really taken that initiative and brought in this other education to bring virtual media experiences to uh, the children or anyone who wants to, who are interested in this i think a very important point you brought out there uh, something i want to in moving towards the latter part you did touch on this but i want to reemphasize it the key lessons we can take now objectively both of us are looking at going out of going out of this going to a post pandemic era where you know, the vaccinations are available where we are capable of at least moving to something where we could function close to a normal that was there before that is what we are trying to go for what are the lessons we can take from online it what are the lessons you have taken from this in terms of getting information across in terms of uh, and in throughout this entire program you address touch them and went ahead in moving to our conclusive segments what should be bear in mind even if we go back to a classroom how can we use online education online learning and really bridge certain disparities that we have may have had before and really bridge those gaps now with the new knowledge that we have yes danidu i think uh, let me give you an example when we going back to face to face classes we have the pluses and advantage and disadvantage both so that's wh that's why we have to come to a middle for example if students miss the classes live streaming classes online for about couple of days will he has time to watch the recording because he has classes in the next week as well he definitely miss this okay so there are chances of students not engaging properly with completely online learning environment but if it is a blended learning mm -hmm. students definitely have an opportunity to engage with the lecturer or the tutor uh, or maybe the school teacher and clarify their doubts and whenever the uh, theoretical component is available students can go and watch the recording okay so that opportunity is there okay but uh, in time to go in time to come they will they will uh, think about certain other virtual classrooms as well moving forward from the uh, blended learning to a virtual classroom so i think uh, it's very important for for us to understanding about this new normal culture exactly. and <coughs> when when the students stepped into uh, uh, school after one and a half years time you know here and there they just went for about one or two small weeks period of time. small period of time but the, because in the past uh, pandemic period the post pandemic era when they when they walk into the school they might see not the friend that they have <laughs> seen before exactly okay in the student who is in grade 3 or maybe grade 2 might not have seen any of their kids face to face so there might be lot of challenges so we have to have room students and the teachers should have the room to have interactions exactly. if they spend the school time period only for teaching how they build their soft skills interpersonal skills the personality mm -hmm. okay during this high school as especially in the primary level students kids they build their personality exactly if we spend teaching the subjects mm -hmm. from 7:30 to 1 pm once they come back then how they build their personality so we have to have some time with online teaching we should not completely forget about that lot of in tech technology should be enabled okay and 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 something which which is really uh, i i wanted to touch mm -hmm. whatever we are doing we have to be accountable exactly. and people have to get the responsibility and in the, it has to be clearly monitored okay so because whatever we are doing we have to think and do it very scientifically uh, danidu mm -hmm. okay so definitely we should come back to the classroom it is necessary for primary and high school especially but we have to have some room for students to engage and develop their personality soft skills and lot of other you know uh, uh, skills which is required to play uh, you know being a, being a, uh, you know wealthy and very uh, interactive person person in society, person in society of okay. course um we have to end the program soon so i will just give you a very brief question you 
you are in a unique position where you have to face teachers, students, parents, all of these uh, communities because you work in academic counselling and all of that. What if there is a student that is lost, or if there is a student that is, you know, finding all of this difficult to comprehend? What is the initial advice? So, what is the initial message you give to the youth, the the young crowds who are, you know, finding their way? through all of this, finding what they desire, what they like, because they are worried whether the market expectations would have changed by the time they move out of you know, campus, given that the requirements have changed, given that there's a pandemic now, given that certain jobs have you know, completely been removed. What is the initial most advice that you give them? Is it to calm down? <laughs> what, what exactly do you tell these people? Tandu, I think uh, what, what students and even adults, as adults, what we have not realized, okay, we are not perfect. Exactly. None of us are perfect. In life so we have to always seek assistance from somebody who really knowledgeable about that particular yeah. segment yeah. okay sometimes that might be your father that might be your mother sometimes if you are afraid to talk to them definitely you have a friend who is really capable of helping you out and sometimes he is not the the hundred percent suitable per person but he will help you out for you to understand the problem Mm -hmm. Okay, and what what we really see, uh, because we are, I think we are uh, in there because uh, in the in the private and the, even the public sector high schools, we don't have student counselors. True. Okay. <coughs> we, even though we have, it's very minimum. Yeah. The ratio of this is not adequate at all. Okay, something which which we really have to focus. Government spending a lot of money on resourcing. Uh, uh, the infrastructure, you know, funding for building infrastructure for salaries on teach for teachers and the administrators. Mm -hmm. So, have you really thought about this, you know, career counselling and having a couple of dedicated, you know, humans there to interact with students? Sure. At least, maybe delegate that kind of a task and train school teachers to do mm -hmm. do that job. So. I, I have a lot of, uh, you know, the corporates and friends and ac even the academics come and talk to me. Uh, Nishan, uh, my daughter has completed advanced in, uh, in health science, but what shall we do? She is going through this difficulty, she has having this problem, but these problems has not been addressed during their school time. So which really we have to address immediately that will help them to shape their career and understand about their career. So always seek support. Support is there. A lot of people and, and, and uh, resources available. is available in the, in, in, in the university schools, but people have to really open up and utilize those, utilize those uh, so, facilities. All right. A very important note to end our discussion. I thank our guest, Ishan Bandar, the registrar of Naloka College of Higher Studies, and he's a coach and also an academic counsellor. A lot of important things. I believe a lot of questions that you answered all throughout our program. I thank our viewers for joining us on Gen XYZ. Let's take this discussion forward weekly and really break down issues that the youth have. Uh, today we discuss issues for into education disparities, a large, uh, large sector and we'll do the same find another topic next week as well stay with us on gen xyz when you join you all next week i'm dandil tanwasa have a great night